Now we finally come to the big application of power series, which is what we call Taylor or Maclaurin series, named for two mathematicians. The goal of a Taylor series or a Maclaurin series is to take a function like e to the x, sine of x, cosine of x, one of these transcendental functions, and represent it as a power series, which you can think of as basically an infinite polynomial. Now why do we want to do this? As you know by this point, polynomials are much easier to work with, especially when it comes to things like derivatives and integrals, and even when it comes to making calculations, they're much simpler than more complicated functions. All you need to do is be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, and you can evaluate a polynomial wherever you like. So this is the application to take these more complicated functions and represent them as power series. The core concept of this whole structure is that we're going to say we're going to create a power series that will fit this function. And to do that, we're going to make this series agree with the function at a particular point. In other words, we're going to say we're going to pick a point, which we'll call the center. This is related to the center of the interval of convergence, or where a power series is centered. So say we pick x equals 0. And we say the function, whatever function we're working with, if that's e to the x, we'll evaluate that function there. e to the 0 is 1. So whatever series we build, when we plug in x equals 0, we must get 1. And based on that rule, we're going to develop some information about the series. But then we're going to go further and say, not only does the series have to line up with that function at a single point, its derivative will also have to line up with the derivative of the function. If we want this function and series to be equal, we're going to say their derivatives have to be equal. And that basically means that they're shaped in the same way around that point. And then we're going to say the second derivative also has to be equal. And the third derivative also has to be equal. And this relatively simple concept of just saying whatever series we construct has to agree with the function both at that point and its first derivative and its second derivative and its third derivative and so on, just making those rules, it turns out, as we'll show in a minute, develops and forces us to pick a certain setup for the series. And so it will actually define the coefficients of the series based on these rules that we've set here. So when we pick this point, if the point we use is x equals 0, then we'll call that a Maclaurin series. A Taylor series is more general. It can work at any point. Maclaurin series is just when x equals 0. So it's simply a naming difference. Historically, of course, the Maclaurin series was developed first, and then the Taylor series is an extension of that. And if you let x equals 0, it's still a Taylor series, but more specifically, we could call it a Maclaurin series. Don't worry too much about the terminology, other than if you see the Maclaurin series, and it doesn't specify the point, you just need to know that that's x equals 0 is the center point. Let me show you a quick description or visual of how this works. Here I've got a Desmos calculator opened up, and I'll post a link to this for our class. This is a visual or a activity that we can play out and see how this applies. So notice the function we have here, we have the function cosine of x, this familiar wave, and then in purple we have a series with a degree of 1. And notice that it just matches at that point and in fact the first derivatives also match. So we've created a straight line that equals cosine of x at 0 and the first derivative also equals the first derivative of cosine of x. So we've constructed this purple line to make that work. If we increase the degree, we let the degree go up to 2, now we're forcing not just the value and the first derivative to agree, we're also forcing the second derivative to agree. So notice how the curvature starts now to match the curvature of the cosine function. And notice that as we move away from the center, this isn't completely matching up with the cosine function. It starts to get some separation as you move out. But if we increase the degree again, now notice that the third derivative agrees, 
And if we go up again, the fourth derivative now agrees. And as we do this, you'll see that this curve starts to line up with the cosine function for more and more of its interval. And we've just gone up to 20 here, but you can see that between about negative eight and positive eight, this purple curve that we're constructing is lining up pretty closely with the cosine function. And you can see how if we continued this process endlessly, that interval of convergence, that range over which this power series approximates the cosine function would extend out. And if we actually went to infinity, it would stop being an approximation and it would actually be exact. So again, once I post this, if you wanna go in and play around with using different functions like sine of x or e to the x and testing what happens, you can see it visually. But we're actually gonna develop the theory behind it and it's relatively simple, although it looks more complicated at first, but the result is surprisingly easy for such a complicated conclusion that we can draw here. Okay, so we're constructing this power series and we're constructing it carefully using this rule that it has to agree with whatever function we're working with and also the derivatives have to agree all the way up. So we're gonna start with this power series and the general form of a power series again is this C sub K, which is just the coefficients of each term times X minus A raised to the power of K. Now we already know that A is the center point for one of these series. So in a given problem, we'll be told where to set the center and that'll be the value of A. It won't cause too much of an issue. Really, the goal then boils down to finding these coefficients because A will be given to us. X is a variable. K is this index on the infinite series. So really the C sub K is the only part that will change from one problem to the next. So for a Taylor series or a Maclaurin series, all we need is that coefficient right there. And we're gonna develop now a formula for these coefficients, which the development might seem kind of complicated, but if you can follow through it at the end, we'll get a formula for what this coefficient is. And then in any given problem, we'll just have to apply that formula. So really the end result actually solving these is not too difficult. So I've written out the power series in series form and also I've written out the first few terms because that's going to be helpful as we start applying these rules where we say the function and the series have to agree at a point. We're gonna plug in that center point and see what happens. Then we'll take the first derivative and plug in the center point again and see what happens. We'll take the second derivative and plug in the center point again and see what happens. And if you want, you can pause the video here and see if you can try working out what's gonna happen. Surprisingly, things simplify quite a lot. And each time we plug in that center point to the function or its derivative or second derivative, each time we get another coefficient. And so we just keep doing this until we see the pattern in the coefficients. Let me show you what I mean. If we say that this function and this series have to agree when x equals a, we just plug in a here and here. And notice that when we do, the right hand side, almost everything disappears because we have x minus a in every term except the first. So all that remains is the first coefficient c0. So that means that f of a and c0 have to be equal, which means we now know the first coefficient is just going to be whatever the value of our function is at a. For instance, if we were looking for the Maclaurin series for e to the x, we would plug in zero, our center, to e to the x, and we would get one. So we would know the first coefficient, c zero, is just one. Then we can take the first derivative. So we have f prime of x. We know, for instance, for e to the x, we know the derivative is also e to the x. And then on the right-hand side, the derivative is just the derivative of a polynomial. So this constant first term disappears, and then c1 times x minus a, when we take the derivative, we just get c1. Then c2 times x minus a squared, 
When we take the derivative there, we get two times C2 times X minus A, and you can see how this goes from there. Now when we plug in A to these first derivatives, again on the left side we just get F prime of A, and on the right side everything except C1 disappears, because again all the other terms include an X minus A that goes to zero when you plug in A. So at this point you may say, okay, C0 is F of A, C1 is F prime of A, you might imagine C2 will be F double prime of A, and C3 will be the third derivative at A, and so on. But it's not quite that easy, we have to be a little bit more careful finding the pattern, but it is almost that easy. If we take the second derivative and the third derivative, I won't take a lot of time to go through this, but you can check these derivatives. Notice what happens here. The next time we apply this process, we get 2C2 plus a bunch of terms that involve X minus A. So the second derivative equals 2C2. So in other words, C2 equals the second derivative at A divided by two. And the third derivative tells us that C3 equals the third derivative at A divided by three times two, or six. If you think about what happens on the next one, if we take the fourth derivative, we would have four times three times two times C4. And that would tell us that C4 is F fourth derivative at A divided by four times three times two, or 24. But notice the pattern. Each coefficient is the same derivative at A, so C1 is the first derivative, C2 is the second derivative, C3 is the third derivative, divided by a factorial. We've talked about factorials earlier with some of the series we've run across, and that factorial pattern emerges here because of the way that we take derivatives with these polynomials. So in general, the pattern is going to be, if we continue this, whatever derivative we take, now we don't want to write these apostrophes over and over and over again for the derivative, so the notation we'll use here is a k in parentheses, which means whatever k is, the kth derivative. of f of x. So if we plug in a to that derivative, we're going to get k factorial times c sub k, which means if we solve for the coefficient c, it's going to be that kth derivative at a divided by k factorial. And of course if we're doing a Maclaurin series, a will be zero, but in general for a Taylor series, we now know that the full form looks like the series from k equals zero to infinity of c sub k times x minus a to the k. And again I'll note if a equals zero this is called the Maclaurin series. This formula looks kind of intimidating, especially if you hadn't seen it developed but it still looks kind of intimidating. But just think about what we're doing here. All we're looking for is these coefficients. If we find those, we can write down the full Taylor series. So in a given problem, we're just going to take derivatives over and over again, each time plugging in A, and we're looking for a pattern in those. So the answer will always have a K factorial in the denominator. We're really focused on this pattern in the derivatives. So that's what we're looking for. And as we do examples of this, you'll see how we take a derivative and then the second derivative and so on, and we look for a pattern in those derivatives when we plug in A. That's really what the whole problem boils down to. If you can handle that process, then the answer will fit into this formula and we'll have the Taylor series.